Um, first of all, I believe that in the next five years, uh, most open source projects, but also projects of, uh, of uh, enterprises, it will be super easy to build them. So you will just click on a button and then you can change the code and you will see the re result of this uh, almost momentarily. So this, these times where you would have to set up IDEs for, for months, and I, I've been there, I've done this at my previous companies. Um, I've seen that at customers still, where it literally takes multiple weeks just to get the IDE and all the plugins configured. I think those days will go away and with it, uh, there will be a new era of, I call it joyful experimentation. My guest today is Johannes Nikolai. He is a long time open source contributor and enthusiast. His latest work is the curated list of self-hosted runner solutions for GitHub Actions. I'm going to put a link for that repository down below. He is a principal solutions engineer at GitHub, where he works with a huge companies like BMW, Continental, Daimler, SAP, and all of their technical, cultural challenges around software development, as well as open and inner source. Prior to GitHub, Johannes was responsible for the development of Subversion, SourceForge, TeamForge, and Garrett as the European head of R&D at CollabNet. Johannes is a colleague of mine, but he is also a very distinguished engineer. He's quite brilliant at whatever he does. Uh, this episode today is really special because we are talking about the future of software engineering from his perspective. And we are shedding the light on a lot of recent uh, publications from GitHub, as well as awesome products that we have released. And we're going to really be talking, going into the sci-fi realm and exploring how software engineering is going to look like in 10, 20, and even 30 years from today. You don't want to miss this session. Stick around until the end. My name is Basim, and this is Glitch. So thank you very much, uh, Johannes, for joining me in this session. Uh, we're going to have a really interesting discussion, and I'm really looking forward for it. We've been planning it for a few weeks, and I have a really interesting set of questions for you. So maybe we start with the one that I'm personally really curious about. Uh, what does it mean to be a solution engineer at GitHub? So being a solutions engineer, I guess, um, at any company, it's working together a lot with different customers and the community. So what I love about the job is that every day is different. So it could be that on Monday I'm doing some CI/CD improvements for autonomous driving at some German car manufacturing. And on Tuesday, I'm on a conference um, giving some uh, ideas of how to increase um, diversity in open source world. And then on Wednesday, it could be that um, I'm helping uh, open source projects like the Corona Warn app, how to deal with abusive spammers. Um, so it's, it's basically showing folks how to make the best out of GitHub. Oh, that's, that sounds awesome. And it seems that you're quite comfortable with uh, switching context and moving around. Is, is this something you've, you've been doing prior to GitHub or this is like the first time you, you do something like that? Um, I would say that's uh, probably part of personality to switch uh, things around so that it doesn't get boring. Um, I was doing some acting, but but nothing professional uh, during school already. So switching into different roles and uh, interacting with many different people and being yeah just close to people, I guess you have to like that in order to be a solution engineer who is enjoying it. Fantastic. And uh, you were the director of engineering at CollabNet, which is now digital at AI prior to GitHub. Um, how and why did you make this switch? I think it has two aspects. One of this uh, solutions engineering aspect, right? In engineering, um, you work closely together with your engineering teams. I definitely enjoyed this very much. Um, just this Saturday it was my birthday party. Most of the folks oh, I worked with, <laughs> thank you, they they just came by and uh, so, so they came from all kinds of different countries um, uh, to celebrate. It was amazing. And while I was very close to my team, it was harder to be close to customers if you're in engineering because it's, it's, it's uh, well, yeah, you have to focus on the, on, the, on the code itself, not so much on what this code will actually do do at your customers. And I wanted to get closer to see the purpose of things. So that was why I decided to become a solution engineer. And the second part of the question then is, what about uh, GitHub? And 
Uh, I was already reading still at Kolebna the blogs of, of GitHub from Zach Holman, from Sam Lambert, Nomi Schloak, how they basically did stuff in production, which I only knew from textbooks, like uh, real DevOps, like zero downtime deployments, including database migration without locking any tables, uh, things like chat ops, this glue between ops and dev to control infrastructure, or um, culture as code, like this idea that not only the engineering folks are using pull requests, but also the sales team and solutions engineering team for blog posts. And this was just so many amazing concepts uh, which I wanted to be part of as well, to practice and not just uh, yeah, read from books. So that's how I came up to join GitHub. I hear you. Yeah, I mean, we're definitely colleague, but colleagues, but we work in different teams. And that was something quite surprising for me when I joined GitHub, right? And like everybody uses GitHub, like for literally everything. And that, that was a little bit mind blowing for me. Can you, can, can you tell me a little bit, what's your perspective on that? Like, wh why do you think we do it? Um, I mean, on, on one hand side, it's, it's eating your own dog food or drinking your own champagne. Um, so, I mean, if, if you're selling the product and you can, even as a as somebody who might not be as technical as uh, your team or my team, if you are close to, if you're using those tools every day, like if, if you're a lawyer at GitHub and you are working on contracts with pull requests and markdown, then you appreciate the software um, and the sales folks, then they go to conferences. It's, it's not rehearsed things where they barely can pronounce the technologies they're advertising, but it, it, they, they basically tell about their day-to-day -day life, right? They go out there and uh, tell how they got approval to, for instance, host the Corona Warn app on, on GitHub with all the premium features without having to pay for it. All those kind of things, uh, which are kind of unique, right? Uh, that, that as a sales folks, you can still tell a credible story um, and having the CI CD functions built in in pull requests uh, also allows you to do typo checks or any kind of um, secret code names right if, if somebody's writing a blog post you will you will get those flagged so also so so this idea of using automation can be transformed to legal documents like non-valid paragraphs as well as um, documentation and so many other aspects. So that's amazing if you don't overdo it, right? If um, there's, I think in the earlier days of GitHub, we did everything with pull requests and marked on including presentations. I would say there's certain use cases like presentations or real-time collaboration on text documents where nowadays um, we also use different tooling, not just GitHub because it was just not practical. Right. So it's, yeah. How do you define the threshold for overdoing it? Like where, where, where do we draw the line? Well, in the moment it creates more pain than gain, right? Like in this case of uh, working on spreadsheets or tables or Google Doc, uh, instead of using Google Docs or Google Spreadsheets, um, it just took longer to come to a conclusion. Whereas right. when it comes to code or blocks, I, I would I would still argue that just the automation around is is worth it. Or if you if you start something in Google Docs or spreadsheets and then when it's in a in an agreed upon form, you then put it into GitHub, wow. for instance. And I see this also a lot with customers where they they sometimes they adopt a process or a way of doing things and they go really deep in it that it becomes really stuck in their in their way and they become really stuck in their ways. And they never really come out of it, even if it becomes super inefficient for them to do it that way, right? Do you see this with your customers as well? And uh, is this something quite common? And then why do you think that happens? That they get stuck in something? Um, well, maybe, sometimes it's cooler to use the tool as what you're actually working on. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe that, that's one reason I'm just, I'm just speculating over here. But um, in the moment, you want to change how your entire team works. It also uh, it takes a lot of, of courage to do so. Mm -hmm. And often you also have to fight against the IT department um, to, to get the tools of, right. of your choice, right? Um, yeah, so it's, it, there's also some kind of cultural resistance the way we, we've yeah. always done it like this before. 
Correct. And the business justification and the internal politics and all of that, uh, that stuff. All right, cool. So let's jump to our topic of the day. Uh, I think this, this fireside chat was titled the, the, the future of software engineering or how does software engineering will look like in the future, right? So how, how does one really approach such a subject or such a topic? Yeah, I thought about this uh, a bit. Um, and I think it has, for me, it has at least three elements. Um, element one is acceptance. Acceptance that uh, like in stock trading, you get many of the predictions just wrong, which is okay as long as some of them are still okay. Right? The second one is then awareness, the second element, being aware that whatever I'm talking about, I'm probably in an echo chamber and I'm heavily biased because of my work uh, at GitHub. So um, yeah, the, what, whatever I'm saying afterwards here, it's, 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 it's bias, although I work with many customers. The good thing about this second element is the third element, narrow scope. So when I'm talking about the future of software, I will probably mostly talk about things that are kind of under GitHub's control. Like uh, Lincoln once said, the best way to in, uh, predict the future is to create it. And with GitHub and many other open source communities based on GitHub, we have at least some influence on where this journey is going. Um, and then when it comes to the question, what is really relevant? Um, I once had an amazing co-worker called Miju Han, who said about the, the relevant stuff are basically the breakthrough innovations. And for breakthrough innovations, there's, there's four criteria. They have to be new, they have to be unique, they have to be valuable. It has to be something which is not just micro optimization of something mm. which you uh, which was done before, and it shouldn't be relabeling of concepts which already <laughs> existed before. Yeah, we do this a lot in software engineering, right? Like we, we rehash old concepts, we just yeah. throw a slap the in a best new brand innovation on them. ever. Yeah, we, we, we exactly. Just spread them around. Like recently, I was reading something about micro front ends that now this is like a, a pattern that's spreading in the field, and I think it has some merits, right? But but again, we're just sort of rehashing or readapting different different concepts from different areas, which is cool. I think that's also part of innovation in many ways. I really like what you said, though, about uh, about localizing uh, uh, what we're going to be talking about, because I also tell a lot of my my customers and students, like if you're looking for interesting work or innovation or side projects, start from the things that if that. Uh, affect you personally, right? Like from on a on a daily basis. What are the tools that you are missing? What are the things that you you need to to build to enhance your workflows? What are the 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 stuff that's going to optimize your 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 day, right? And I think being at GitHub puts us in a very nice position to influence a lot of this. And, and let, let's start by talking a little bit about about your perspective. And let's be pragmatic. So on the short <laughs> term, for the next five to ten years. Uh, <laughs> How will software engineering look like? So one of my favorite authors is William Gibson, a neuromancer, and he said, uh, the future is already there. It's just unevenly distributed. <laughs> and when it comes to predictions in the next five years, we probably have this technology already. And I said, I warned you before, it's mostly about my GitHub lens. So bear with me in that one. Um, so first of all, I believe that in the next five years, uh, most open source projects, but also projects of, uh, of uh, enterprises, it will be super easy to build them. So you will just click on a button and then you can change the code and you will see the re result of this uh, almost momentarily. So this, these times where you would have to set up IDEs for, for months, and I, I've been there, I've done this at my previous companies. Um, I've seen that at customers still, where it literally takes multiple weeks just to get the IDE and all the plugins configured. I think those days will go away. And with it, uh, there will be a new era of, I call it joyful experimentation. Like um, my my daughter is a big Roblox fan. And she was asking me to, to find some project on GitHub to, to, to design shirts for Roblox. And I was looking at this, uh, at, at a, I was searching on GitHub for Roblox shirt generators. And I find this repository with a readme, which just says Roblox shirt generator, nothing <laughs> else. Yeah. And I thought, should I try this one out on my company laptop? <laughs> and, uh, it, it, it's some kind of an extension to, to, to a multiplayer game. And I don't know what it will download on my computer. Um, so 
probably not, but uh, using GitHub code spaces, I was just clicking on it and about 30 seconds later, it was built and I could try it out and it was actually legit. And it was actually programmed by a 12 year old. That was also pretty wow. amazing, right? Okay, and, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, and this idea that you can try out everything you want um, risk-free and super fast, uh, I think at least those, those projects, they will win the hearts of the open source developers and companies who, uh, who adopt this in their professional working style, they will win the heart of developers. If you can basically experiment without risk. And then when you have those IDEs uh, or build environments that are automatically set up, I believe there will be more and more bots that help you to, to either code, like uh, write tests, like uh, you shown so nicely in your previous sessions about Copilot, but also tell you if you're including a uh, vulnerable dependency or if you have done a, um, a programming mistake or if you want to if you want to uh, automatically generate a UI, just take a snapshot uh, with a photograph of something you sketched in your in your notebook, and it will turn it into code. So I think there will be more and more intelligent bots helping you to achieve what you want, including documentation, and so on. Yeah, that's that's my my near term prediction. I hear you. Yeah, I have a few thoughts about this. So it seems like in the in the past few years we were focusing a lot on the pipeline automation, right? How can we build faster? How can we test uh, in an automated manner? How can we deploy and release in a faster way? And it seems like the, the, the upcoming trends are more focused on the developers and making sure their experience is, is frictionless as, or as frictionless as possible. And we make sure that they are as productive as they can be in their own environments. And I think code spaces plays a big role in this in just creating this sandbox sort of environment where we can run experiments, bootstrap monolith, app, monolith apps that can take minutes to or even hours to be, you know, bootstrapped, and then and then we can get we can get going with it. And and I really like this because I also feel that uh, maybe a little bit this vision was influenced sort of by Microsoft. I mean, for the longest time, my friends used to say. I mean, Microsoft has a lot of awesome things, but they're really, really great in building developer tools, right? And Visual Studio, for example, is one of is one big testament for that. It's like one of the most wonderful IDEs. Just <laughs> yeah, like, Visual Studio yeah. Code for sure. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, assume that you disagree in terms of opinions uh, on that one. Uh, right? Well, I think Visual no, I mean, Visual Studio Code is amazing. Um, I'm not so sure about Visual Studio. Um, Interesting. But, What's your perspective yeah. on it? Just like just for fun. Um, well, so so I guess I like Visual Studio Code already because it's one of Erich Gamma's uh, projects, right? And, okay. and Erich Gamma, that was I would say the most influential book on computer science I ever read was the Design Patterns book from the Gang of Four, led by Erich Gamma. And it was, when I was hearing that he's switching from the Eclipse ecosystem to Visual Studio Code, I thought, okay, that can only be a home <laughs> right? Um, yeah. Regarding Visual Studio, I, I mean, I'm I'm a Linux person. Uh -huh, I, okay. I, 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 I grew up with Linux, uh, I love Linux and uh, Visual Studio was never part of that ecosystem. Whereas mm -hmm. Visual Studio Code, I mean, it was also adopted across Mac, uh, across the Linux community. That's the amazing thing, right? Uh, if anybody told me 10 years back that there's a tool from Microsoft that is loved in all of those <laughs> different communities, I would say, well, well yeah. So, but, but yeah, they made it definitely. So thank you, Eric. <laughs> 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 no, I hear you. I hear you fully. No, I, I think uh, I, I'm also a Linux uh, person, to be honest, for sure. And uh, but I've also had uh, certain phases where I dabbled with stuff like C sharp, and I came with a lot of prejudice and biases around it. Right? Like, uh, what is this toy sort of thing? And and is this really gonna give me the same powerful stuff that I've I've used elsewhere and whatnot? But I also, that's where really I discovered a lot of the really powerful, rich ecosystem that um, we were not really exposed to, or at least I was not really exposed to. And that gave me a, not, an interesting perspective, you know, on, on this on this tooling uh, mm -hmm. and it gave me a little bit of more respect for it. Uh, so that's that's where my, my experience and my perspective comes mm -hmm. in. But yeah, I can understand totally. We, we have various quite varied backgrounds and diverse backgrounds and we have different opinions about uh, yeah. positive and negative experiences. Yeah. For example, if you tell me anything about Eclipse, 
I say no, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to touch that. Now we have to go into VI versus Emacs, right? Um, yeah, right. <laughs> That's the next step for sure. And then the NeoVim uh, folks will come in and. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, there's now an extension, I think, for VI and Copilot. Um, I thought it's pretty amazing. Yes. Right? Definitely. I think uh, that's the next step for us. We're going to be supporting Vim. And I heard IntelliJ is also the mix, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah as long as it's it. not Emacs, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're definitely alienating a lot of people with this uh, fireside yeah. chat. But I think that's fine. We all have strong opinions <laughs> about our tools. So that's, that's always good. <laughs> as long as you have healthy conversations about them, for sure. All right. Cool. Um, Jumping to the next question uh, mm -hmm. of mine, is there anything special that software engineers need to prepare or need to do to prepare for the short-term uh, changes in our field or innovations? Yes, I think so. I mean, um, I was asked in some, some other talk whether Copilot or any other GitHub feature or AI feature will take people's job away, right? Um, <laughs> and my answer to this one is there's literally 0% chance that a bot will take away your job, but there is a real chance that somebody else who knows better how to use those bots will take your job away, right? So if you go on websites like willrobotstakemyjob.com, you'll see that um, there's this job description of a programmer and a software developer. For a programmer, where they basically say, you're just implementing things according to an already existing specification and change test sets and um, data forms, the chance that you will be replaced by some bot is 48% in the next five years. Whereas for software developers, where you're working in a creative session together with customers and create something unique, uh, appealing, there's just a 4% chance. And <laughs> if you if you think about bots as something that will help you to, to, to get boring parts, but necessary parts of your job done, like creating a... A, well, the basics of UI, I would say, or writing code which doesn't depend on on uh, outdated dependencies, then you probably have a big advantage as the folks who say, "Oh no, I have to do everything on my own." It's like, it, like, like those times in automotive where folks said, "Well, if I, I don't use automated gears because I know way better how to use manual transmissions." And there's probably one or two percent of folks who, who are really pro and who are really better with manual transmission. Anybody else will lose to, to that part. But the important thing is not how to use those, right? It's that you are aware that it's there and that you know where to drive and that you enjoy stuff, right? And so, yeah, so, so make use of those spots or at least see what they can do. And when I was looking at Copilot, I was immediately uh, initially expecting something like a better version like IntelliSense or so. Yeah, and, right. exactly. and it was nothing at all like this, right? So I was I was very much blown away from it from the beginning, but I, yes. I've also seen its its limits quite quite early. So yeah, 100%. get 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 uh, get acknowledged to the fact that there will be bots more and more use them to your advantage. They give you superpowers. Hundred percent. I think as part of the excitement around machine learning, we overblown a little bit uh, the the concept, and we started talking about sentient uh, artificial intelligence and all of that stuff. And I think we're really decades away from it. That's at least my opinion, my perspective after playing around with machine learning a little bit. I think we're quite far from there. We need like a a breakthrough on multiple levels for us to attain that. And I, I don't think. Tools like Copilot, and I, I specifically use the term tool because that's what it is, right? Uh, are, 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 they're not there. I think they are fantastic uh, helpers. Uh, I've done three videos on Copilot demonstrating the different facets of it and, and how it could be used, where it is powerful, where are the, its shortcomings, does it enhance your productivity or doesn't, does it make you a better developer or not, and that's a subjective opinion. Uh, but yeah, I think Copilot is going to be really, really interesting, and it will add a lot of value for a lot of people in different in different places. And I was I was just uh, over the weekend playing around with um, a requirement from a customer of mine who wanted to uh, bi-directionally synchronize some Azure and some AWS artifacts, copying mm -hmm. just files around, basically keep, keeping two directories in sync. 
And there's numerous of examples in, on GitHub how to copy stuff from AWS to the file system and from Azure to the file system, but nothing bidirectional uh, from, from the tool providers themselves for obvious mm -hmm. reasons, right? And, <laughs> and Copilot, uh, when I started to write the code, it, it actually used the command line parameters of the Azure tools for the AWS tools and the other way around. And it didn't get to the idea that you could use the local hard disk for, for <laughs> intermediate storage, right? So <laughs> yeah, you, you, you're basically staying in the area of what has already been created and, and you're mimicking behavior without really knowing what this behavior really is. So it, 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 it definitely showed its limits, but if you, yeah, this is like autonomous driving, right? If, if, it, if my, my car drives already two thirds of the way autonomous on German Autobahn, but if there's any kind of challenging situation, like uh, uh, like there's uh, some construction work going on, I need, I need to take over, right? Um. Yeah, yeah, I hear you, I hear you, definitely, awesome. Um, to me, it feels like uh, the fundamentals of our field uh, have not really changed across the years, right? I mean, like I've been programming for at least 14, 15 years. Mm -hmm. uh, you probably a little bit more or, or less. You, you look younger. I more or less. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and uh, it seems that the, the fundamentals are, are still the same, right? We introduced mm -hmm. automation. We sped up our workflows. We we enhanced how we, we do certain things. We've introduced like agile, test-driven development, BDD, and all of these different concepts. But we have not really witnessed a, a strong paradigm shift in the way we do things. Do you think this is mm. going to come soon? Do you have any idea how what's, what's going to be the form of yeah. that if it ever comes? I mean, I think you're absolutely right with um, many of those observations, like also imperative object-oriented programming languages rules since 30 years. And uh, we have uh, basically typing things into our IDEs. Um, so, so me, Johan, who is now working at Twitter, but when she, uh, when she talked about this was still at GitHub, um, she, she made an interesting observation about uh, innovations that uh, appear because of data sets being uh, qualitative enough to make breakthrough innovations. And, um, and she had an interesting, um, so some interesting data points, which said that <clears throat> it, 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 a, in, in, in algorithm, for breakthrough innovation, like in, uh, for instance, speech recognition or uh, image recognition or playing chess, they are often 20 plus years old. Like uh, like uh, things like chess, the algorithm that actually beat Kasparov was invented in 1983, or the one for speech recognition, hidden Markov model in 1984 and uh, image recognition in 1989. So, so 18 years, I think is the average. Uh, until a breakthrough in this area was made. And then you look at the data sets, like the, the data set for, for speech recognition, which made the breakthrough was in 1991. And then the actual breakthrough was in 1994 or for, for image recognition, the best data or the, the first good data set was 2010. And then the breakthrough came four years later. So what I'm getting at is once we have a data set, which is structured and sufficiently large and of good quality, there's breakthroughs happening. And I would argue that with Copilot, for instance, this Codex data set on this uh, improved GPT-3, that's probably already such a breakthrough. And I can imagine in maybe 10 to 15 years, we have similar things with CodeQL and static code mm. analysis. So, uh, so while it's not perfect, it will still be mind-blowing breakthroughs based on those massive data sets. I think right. this is where I would bet my, uh, yeah, bet my money if I had to, where those innovations come from next. You mentioned CodeQL and thank you for that. Uh, but for the audience who's watching this and they don't know what CodeQL is, can you give us like a small summary of, of what, what that is? Yeah, so, so CodeQL is a, a language uh, which was invented by some uh, folks from Oxford University uh, who created a startup to, to, to query the semantics of any, any programming language. But so something like SQL for programming languages, uh, very sophisticated. And after a couple of years, 
they learned that uh, you can you can answer all kinds of questions which are irrelevant when it comes to static code analysis. And then more and more security researchers started to use CodeQL to write queries to find out about vulnerabilities in source code, which nobody has found mm. uh, before. Like it's more than 120 CVEs in, in they, they found in Linux kernel, Chrome OS, so really prestigious projects. And then they thought, let's let's uh, crowdsource this so instead of keeping the queries for ourselves let's open source them which they did on lgtm looks good to me.com uh, they got later acquired by github and now the idea is that for any kind of vulnerability which comes out which gets a cde there will be a code ql query which is describing the problem so that you do not only find this one instance but any kind of variation of it and it's not just github doing this there's folks from um from uh Apple, from Microsoft, from IBM, uh, from SAP, who are contributing whenever they find something that it will never occur again. Uh, so once this corpus of, of rules is getting big enough and it's coupled with uh, runtime um, analysis data, maybe uh, things from, from Dependabot, for instance, where you learn about new, new vulnerability, then I, I imagine is similar to minority report right you're you're typing stuff in your editor and while you're typing you get something similar to a spell check in a word processor but it's it's not like uh, it will tell you that you have a typo but that you're just going to create an sql injection not because the um and then the computer knows that not because uh it, it can magically defeat uh the uh, the holding problem or the sentence of rise but because it has seen so many SQL injections in the past that from the data set, it can just conclude you're doing something um, which is potentially dangerous and then even better um, give you a fix, right? Because it turns out if, if you just get warnings, humans are not really good in criticism if it's, if it's not coming with actionable feedback. 100%. So what you really want is some click on a button and now you don't have that problem anymore. I don't think that <laughs> Before you have this click on a button thing, it will help a lot. hundred percent. As a developer, the last thing I want is a list of problems that I have to go research how to solve. And then I have to go and rethink my code implementation, you know, to fix them, irrespective of how dangerous the vulnerability or the problem is, right? That's, that's amazing. I want to, I want to get a bit of, I want to dig a little bit deeper into CodeQL and ask you like, why is it more powerful than just static code analysis and just you know searching for code smells or or, or certain you know, rules uh, that have been part of a database? Um, I would I mean it's it's kind of static code analysis. I think the the great aspect of it's really this crowdsource idea. Mm. Like um, like CodeQL in comparison to many other tools has been written in a way that every single check which is in code ql has been expressed in that language so it's not mm -hmm. that a vendor built uh, hundreds of, uh, of 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 static rules basically in the engine yeah. proprietary and then you can extend it with some custom regex things but really every single part every single rule can be expressed with the building blocks and then well if a code ql is open source so and it's free for any public repository so right. it's just it's just the crowd providing us the queries and and and, and making, yeah, making it, it the data set bigger every single day. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. that's the difference to to many other things out there. Interesting. Okay. And I and I was um I understood that it goes onto the abstract syntax tree le level and it just searches for the problems on 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 that level. And I think that's a little bit more powerful than just having a set of, let's say, uh, rules or regular expressions or certain variations of how you can write your code, right? It can definitely understand program structure and data flows yeah. and uh, what is this thing and what is it obtained analysis. And it, it's also based on, on kind of an object-oriented variation of, of SQL, right? Mm. CodeQL, where you can <laughs> define entire libraries so that you're, uh, that you're just extending a, a, a query or a library when you found uh, something something new 
um, so that you know, your queries are not too long. Also, what what is what you're building on the shoulders of giants? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So it's not like a rule engine. It's more of a DSL uh, that that just gives you a lot of more options and a lot more power. Awesome. All right, I want to jump to the last segment of our talk. This has been really amazing so far. Uh, but I want to go like really, really far into the future, right? Okay. So, <laughs> I don't know if we can even yeah. imagine that. So 30 My years from today, awesome. yeah. <laughs> we're going to go into sci-fi territory now, yeah. right? So 30 years from today, it's the year 2051. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. what, what are your predictions about, like, forget how the world is going to look like. <laughs> you have a young daughter. Super hot probably, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> we don't young care young about daughter, computers right? anymore. Um, yeah, right? We have so, global so warming and a lot more, <laughs> like, more difficult let's problems. Assume, yeah. Let's assume there's still folks there, yeah, right? Yeah. And, um, well, I'm coming back to my daughter uh, in this case because uh, for her, programming is not something isolated just for the purpose of programming, but it's just something not to get the job done, but to get the fun done, right? So she's mm -hmm. she's designing games in Roblox, for instance, and the programming is just something you have to do to get it work. And she's she's cutting videos where she's applying effects. and. She would never. She would never expect a school topic called uh, video cutting, right? It's. It's. In, in, I'm not sure whether this is a proper translation from German, but it's. There's so-called cultural techniques like writing, singing, and so on. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that programming is something they will have in school in in 2051. It's just something behind the scenes. Sometimes you have to do it. And in most cases, you probably don't even realize you're doing it by. You, you, you're designing a game or whatever else which, which, uh, which helps maybe to fight global warming and you're seeing an immediate result of what you just described and then you're basically saying, yeah, this is already, looks already right and this part doesn't look right and then it will just adopt it and uh, you, you're refining behavior by giving visual feedback, haptic feedback, audio feedback, feedback from other folks. Um, yeah, so I guess uh, Microsoft would call this citizen development or citizen coding, right? So, nice. so nothing you would uh, you would really think about programming uh, anymore. It's yeah, that's that's I guess my idea. Um, we would finally future. achieve uh, achieve the dream of highly abstract building blocks that you can just integrate <laughs> together and just have everything work uh, automatically and without uh, bugs. Exactly. Maybe <laughs> even about thinking, right? Like I I was. I, I still know those discussions with my parents whether I could have a computer, right? I guess yeah. in two generations, maybe they're discussing whether it's okay to get an implant when you're 14 instead of a tattoo, right? right and exactly. then you, you yeah. just think about stuff and it, it, it just appears on your in your inner eyes like like it heads up this way, right? It's, 100%. Well, it's, it's a bit scary, but uh, well, it's, future 100%. is always a bit scary. <laughs> yeah, totally. And I think, I think, I think the integration with the machines is, is in my opinion, it's inevitable. I mean, it, I think it's the next leap in our evolution. And without really going too deep into that, maybe we can leave that for another session where we can, you know, talk about the philosophy and, and all of that sci-fi stuff. But I, I think, yeah, we, we need it. I think we need it. We can only go so far as uh, on the biological level. And I think uh, we will need some some extra attachments, let's say, to go to the next level. <laughs> All right, awesome. And on this on this note, uh, do you have any any parting thoughts? Any last uh, yes. comments? Yes. Um... Um, I mean, first of all, I guess uh, if, if you folks out there disagree with many things we just said, that's good, right? It just shows that you have an opinion on your own. And, and most of this will probably be just, will, will not age well. But I guess if we, if we manage to show that the future will be fundamentally different in software development, we already made our point. And, and different is not always better. But in order to make things better, better things will always be different. So um, don't see bots as a, a threat, but something like a suit or some, uh, or an intelligent assistant that gives you superpowers, right? And uh, the great thing about open source and, uh, and, and GitHub is that you can shape this future. Uh, you can decide uh, how to use those bots 
to define the future you want to see so that it's not a dystopy. So if you don't want to end up with anything we just said, then just make it differently. And I'm already very much looking forward to the things you will create uh, with your superpowers. So am I. That's a very lovely thought, uh, Johannes. Thank you very much for your uh, participation today. I really had so much fun and uh, I hope we can get to do this again uh, sometime soon. Thank you also. Enjoyed it very much.